What would you say was the biggest meat-eating dinosaur to ever have walked on this earth? If you say T-Rex, you're wrong. Hello, I'm Kathy Lair, and on this edition of Focus, we'll travel back in time 230 million years ago when dinosaurs walked the planet. At the new exhibit at the Cincinnati Museum Center, we'll come face to face with some of the biggest and most unusual dinosaurs ever. It is the U.S. premiere of Ultimate Dinosaurs, Giants from Gondwana. In addition to seeing beasts you've probably never seen in books or on TV before, you'll be able to experience the dinosaurs in a whole new way through augmented reality. Our guest today to lead us on down a path of new discovery from the Cincinnati Museum Center, Dr. Brenda Hunda, curator of invertebrate paleontology, and Elizabeth Pierce, Vice President of Marketing Communications. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, after all the Jurassic Park movies, I thought that I'd seen just about every kind of dinosaur there ever was. And now comes word that we have this whole new group. How did this come to be? Well, dinosaurs as a group of animals were around on Earth for 200 million years. You can imagine how many different types of creatures there might have been at that time, given the biodiversity that we have today on Earth. So we only actually have a small sliver of the total biodiversity of dinosaurs um, that have ever walked the planet. And as we open up new avenues of exploration, new areas, Europe, Asia, mm -hmm. and now the southern continents, like Antarctica, and go and explore there, scientists, paleontologists are making some fantastic new discoveries, and they will continue to do so for probably hundreds of years. Now these dinosaurs were found where? These are in the southern continents. Okay. So this exhibit focuses on Madagascar, Africa, South America, Antarctica. And all of those continents were once united as a supercontinent known as Gondwana. All righty. Now, when we go back to take a look at some of these dinosaurs, the, the ones that are on your exhibit, mm -hmm. how are they different from the ones that we traditionally think of, like the T-Rex and Triceratops and some of those? Well, we like to say that Giganotosaurus is T-Rex's bigger, better cousin. And uh, we, at the end of the exhibition, the T-Rex and Giganotosaurus are, are kind of squaring off for one another. So you can compare <laughs> their, what is similar, you know, they both have very tiny arms, but what's different, and that is the types of teeth, and, and you know, Brenda's the expert on evolution and biodiversity, but I've learned just as a layperson that, you know, it, life evolved differently in South America and in the southern continents, and therefore these dinosaurs that we thought we knew are actually a little bit different than, than the ones we know. What's the difference between T-Rex and his bigger, badder cousin? Well, one thing I understand is the difference between the jaw. So the T-Rex jaw Nasty. is bo <laughs> supposedly bone crushing. You know, I don't, I'm not sure, that you have to decide which death you'd rather have. Would you like to be crushed by his jaw? No. Or would you like to be torn to shreds by Giganotosaurus's super wow. sharp teeth? And you know, that's just one of the, one of the small differences. <laughs> How is this area chosen for an exhibit of this magnitude to have the U.S. premiere right here in Cincinnati? Well, I'll let Brenda talk a little bit about the history of, of paleontology in this area, because it's really important. Well, actually, uh, Big Bone Lake, Kentucky, just mm -hmm. about 20 miles south of the river, was a birthplace of vertebrate paleontology in the Western Hemisphere. It actually was the first official vertebrate paleontology dig in 1806 uh, at the behest of Thomas Jefferson. William Clark went down there and collected bones, which were transferred to France and also were given to Thomas Jefferson at Monticello and also held in the East Wing of the White House. Wow. <laughs> so we have an ex excellent and important historic place in vertebrate paleontology as a whole. It was the first place in this region in North America. But we also have a really critical role to play in invertebrate paleontology. And anybody who has lived here long enough to go creaking mm -hmm. or get stuck at the cut in the hill on the I-75 in traffic, sees those big sections of rocks on the side of the road. And those are the deposits of an ancient ocean that was covering most of the United States 450 million years ago. And they're world famous for their fossils. We have paleontologists come from all over the world, have had research for over 200 years in the area, documenting the biodiversity of the oceans at that time. So in essence, it's super appropriate yep. that we would have such an amazing paleontological exhibit here in Cincinnati because we are world famous for our paleontology. Certainly that's one of the reasons that the Royal Ontario Museum was happy to partner with us is that they know the work that Brenda and Glenn do and they know the reputation of this area. And then added to that, we've talked a lot about other special exhibitions we brought to Cincinnati Union mm -hmm. Terminal, is it's a great place 
to do special exhibitions. We have 15,000 square feet. It's a black box. It's easy to move these exhibits in and out. And, you know, we, we put 200 tons of granite in um, when Cleopatra came, and now we've got sauropods. <laughs> <laughs> how many really big dinosaurs. How many really big dinosaurs do you have there? There are 20 dinosaurs in this exhibition, and uh, their skeletal casts are articulated so you can see what they really looked like, um, all the bones together. And then we have a number of individual fossils that are um, also there with us. Now, what's a cast? A cast is essentially a replica. So when you have a bone, you make a mold of it, and then you pour in material, usually like an epoxy resin, which will make a lighter version of a cast. It pretty much makes an almost exact replica. Of it. And the reason why we use casts is, is really primarily twofold. The first is when you dig up a fossil, any fossil, dinosaurs mm -hmm. no exception, it's very rare to find the entire animal together. Uh, the, the erosion, mm -hmm. um, scavengers after the death of the animal, just the vagaries of time uh, often eliminate certain elements of the animal. So we have to replace those with things that are anatomically correct or close to. The second reason is that fossilized bone is rock. It's mm -hmm. permineralized, so the, the, the pore spaces in the bone have been filled with mineral, which makes them very, very heavy and very difficult to mount. You could imagine basically mounting a rock sauropod. Yeah. Uh, that's an engineering challenge. <laughs> it's not good for the structure, and it's not good for the bones themselves either. We want to keep the specimens uh, pristine and in good condition for scientific research. So we make cast replicas of them um, for exhibition. Now we have the cast dinosaurs. We also have an augmented reality experience. Yep. Tell me a little bit about that, and then we're going to try to show you a little bit sure. of a representation. <laughs> well, so the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto mounted this exhibition to begin with, and they were really interested in this concept of augmented reality and, and how could they use it to bring dinosaurs to life in a whole new way. And so there are a couple different ways that it's utilized in the exhibition, and we'll show you kind of how it works from a marketing <laughs> standpoint. Okay. But it is a, you know, a special animation that is activated by this marker, and if you have the Ultimate Dinosaur app, on your phone, there we go. you can hear him oh, roaring now. Oh, look at that. Pardon you can pet fingers. him. <laughs> you, I mean, you can take pictures of yourself basically petting the dinosaur. Yeah, but he might How weird is finger. that? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> oh, I think oh, he's just he, taking a bite of my go. thumb. Ah. <laughs> so there's Giganotosaurus in action right there. Um, the augmented reality is a really fun way, obviously, to take the dinosaurs out and about around town and also in the exhibition, we have iPads that uh, go up against the skeletal casts and, um, and they flesh out the dinosaur bones. And so they'll show you. Oh, whoa, look at that one bursting through. <laughs> Isn't he fun? Oh, this is awesome. Now, these can be used with an iPad or an iPhone. You right. just have to download the app. Download the Cincinnati Ultimate Dinosaurs app from the App Store. It's free. And, you know, we can <laughs> play around with it like we just did here. You can bring your iPhone and your iPad into the exhibition. There are other markers there. There are a couple other dinosaurs. In addition to Giganotosaurus, he's got a couple friends in the augmented reality world. And it's just a fun way for people to engage and interact with it. And then there's additional information that's available on the app. And then even better, Better, you can use that that button that says take my picture with the dinosaur and you know kind of make it come to life even more ah, so your <laughs> own private dinosaur picture exactly what a exactly. wonderful experience and the cards that that we're demonstrating with today These are cards. those are some of the trading cards that you can pick up in the exhibition and uh, so we have 20 trading cards kind of like baseball trading cards because we're featuring a different dinosaur every week from the beginning until mid-october and you can come in and get those dinosaur trading cards <laughs> on a weekly basis because you know what five-year-old to ten-year-old little boy doesn't want to come back and see the to dinosaurs 40 year old <laughs> to 40 year old say, probably let's, let's even double that seriously <laughs> <laughs> well, I love the Jurassic Park generation because this whole group of us is, we're mm -hmm. all very excited about these dinosaurs, as what you said earlier. It? What is it about dinosaurs that seems to fascinate us so much? Do you you know, there's just nothing like them on Earth now. I mean, the closest thing we have to a very large reptile, if you will, is like the Komodo dragon. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It's not even close to some of the beasts that are 110 feet long that walk the Earth. And maybe we're lucky. <laughs> yeah, well, there is the, <laughs> exactly. But you know, they they captivate our fascination. Mm -hmm. We call them the media darling of paleontology. They do a very good service to the science uh, for us, and they they um, they show uh, show people that the truth is actually stranger than fiction. I don't think if we actually tried to make these creatures up in a movie, we actually could do it. 
but somehow nature and evolution have a way of, of creating some very interesting and bizarre forms. Absolutely. And now we enjoy the, them. Is this exhibit at all too scary? for young children? No, not at all. In fact, we have all sorts of kids running through it and they're just shouting with glee and having so much fun. <laughs> Plus, in, in addition to, it's got really good science and really accessible science to talk about tectonic plate theory and to talk about all of, of the, the background that goes with it for the adults who really want to have that, that Nova kind of science experience <laughs> um, hands-on and right in, in their own museum. So it's a good combination. And then we've also got the ultimate dinosaur um, Omnimax film because there are a couple dinosaurs that were literally too big to bring into Union Terminal, if you can think about that. What? And so Union Terminal is huge. We've put them on, now we put them <laughs> on the five-story dome of the Omnimax Theater. The, the Argin, Argentinosaurus, or Argentinosaurus, Futalongosaurus, yeah. all how these big, crazy names. How big were these things? Well, there's a femur bone of this guy in the exhibit space, and it's probably 25 or 30 feet long. Yeah, mm, that's a huge one. And that's just his leg bone, right? So that's, yeah. you know, it's, um, but you can see it on the on the Omnimax screen and you can, you can trace the work of one of the paleontologists in Argentina as he's making these new discoveries, like Brenda said earlier. And so you get another glimpse of Giganotosaurus in action and then the evolution of some of these um, dinosaurs into birds and understand some of those connections a little bit deeper. What are some of the more unusual dinosaurs that we'll see here that maybe we haven't seen before? Well, so I have to consult my uh, my 100 Days of Fun guide because there are so <laughs> many and they're wonderful. I mean, the Carnotosaurus is one with almost no arms whatsoever. So you gotta think, how is this guy eating or feeding himself? I mean, we- Really we, big teeth. Gigantic <laughs> teeth. Which is actually a, a common theme in, in uh, carnivorous dinosaurs, this loss of arms. So it's interesting to see that, that they continue. And you know, there are some, this guy's name is the Dawn Plunderer, the Eoraptor. He's one of the earliest dinosaurs ever discovered. Okay. Yeah. And then my favorite is this guy back here, who uh, we call Armongosaurus. Mm. Armongosaurus. He, isn't, he, isn't he cute? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> He's got these huge spines that come off his vertebrae that are almost he about looks one like and a half. Dragon. That's yeah. what he reminds me kind of. If I were to look at that, I would they're like that big looks more sails, like a dragon. but they're actually attached to his vertebrae, and they're about a foot and a half long. Was and they he make a meat this huge too? No, he's yeah. a he's a sauropod, so he's a, a herbivore. Isn't that amazing too? Yeah, they're so big, wow. and yet they were only eating leaves, right? So it's interesting. They'd have to eat all day. <laughs> oh, I guess so. Now, if you go back in time, what kind of dinosaurs were likely to have roamed the earth right here? In, in the Cincinnati region. area. Well, you know, one of the, the major questions that we get at the Museum Center is um, whether they've, people have found dinosaur fossils yes. in the area. Yes. And, and the answer is, is that we won't find dinosaur fossils in the area because the rocks of the right age, the Mesozoic time period, is not represented in Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. And that's not because dinosaurs were never here, all those rocks weren't here. We were just exposed for a long period of time. And the rocks that would have preserved those dinosaurs have been eroded away over 200 million years. Um, and so you can imagine that the fauna here in North America would have been very similar to what we kind of think of um, out west in Utah and mm -hmm. Montana. Um, interestingly enough, even though the dinosaurs are really unique and strange in South mm -hmm. America, they still represent the major clades of dinosaurs that we have here in North America. So you're still seeing hadrosaurs, you're still seeing the, the ornithischian dinosaurs, you're still seeing the big carnivores, and you're still seeing the big sauropods similar to what we would have had here roaming in Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. We know that dinosaurs occupied every continent on Earth, wow. so we know that they didn't miss us. We just don't have the record um, here to preserve them. The glacier would have pushed it away? The glacier and other, um, other erosion through time, yep. Now how long is this exhibit going to be on display? Good news is that it's here until the early part of January, so it's a great thing to take advantage of over the summer, it's a great thing to take advantage of during the fall. We're going to celebrate National Fossil Day, which is October 16th. We're going to have an entire week of Fossil Fest activities. <laughs> I love that, Fossil Fest. I mean, That's exactly. It's a great party, it's a great party. And then it'll be here during the holiday season, and it'll be a great companion to the Holiday Train Exhibition that we annually put on. So, I mean, it's a wonderful, Great family experience, multi generational. Bring you know dad down and, and little kid down and grandpa down, and, and everybody can have a great time together. And, and we're doing wonderful science programs. There's a wonderful book out now called T Rex, T E A Rex. So you can have a tea party with a dinosaur. <laughs> and, That's unique. You know, so there's lots of fun stuff for all ages. We're working on a, a Cincinnati Winosaurus event, so we can have some wines from so, Chile oh, and Argentina. Nice. Kind of weaving any, it in there. Any reason for that? Uh, you know the the. 
yeah. some more of that region. Maybe we may taste dinosaur in the wine. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> now, how closely do you work with the schools and educational facilities when you're putting together these types of programs? Well, we we always want to be partners with the schools across all the districts and um, have the standards of the exhibition match up with the Common Core standards and what the schools need from mm -hmm. us. And the Royal Ontario Museum, who put the exhibition together, did a phenomenal job of really putting together nice curriculum to go in tandem with the exhibition. So great pre-visit materials, great post-visit materials, obviously great experience when you're at the museum. In addition to the augmented reality in the exhibit, there are a couple other um, video game type things that explain how the continents drifted apart and came back together over time. So it's a, it's a very rich learning experience. What kind of reaction have you gotten? I, I'm just really curious to see any, especially younger children, when they see this, I mean, I know this l little older ch child was <laughs> amazed by it. What, what kind, what's the reaction? Oh, it's like? the same reaction. Oh my gosh, you're kidding! <laughs> and you know, and uh, of course, all these kids that are growing up with iPads themselves, you know, kind of push their parents out of the way. Oh, I'll show you how this works, mom. And, <laughs> right, exactly. So, and it's very simple to download. Anybody who who really can go online to the App Store and can download. Right, this. absolutely. So it's iPhone and iPod uh, and iPad, but not uh, any other operating system. So only on the iOS system, but it's easy to get right off the app store at Cincinnati Ultimate Dinosaurs. Now when you go to the Fossil Fest, what kind of things can we expect to see there? Well, the Fossil Fest really is um, about encouraging our community to come out and to appreciate our fossil heritage. So while we do have a lot of stuff for, like, uh, regarding dinosaurs, particularly the exhibit, sure. um, our main focus really has also been on the fossil heritage of this region, so the invertebrate fauna of the late Ordovician about 450 million years ago. We have people that bring in their own collections to showcase, uh, to, deal, to talk with the public about what they collect and, and what organisms they can find. We have information about where the public can go collect in a safe and appropriate manner. A lot of uh, scavenger hunts for looking for fossils on the floor and interact with, with families and kids. It really is a wonderful major event. Is there even a way for you to kind of tell us what, what to look for if we're out <laughs> along some of these creek beds or across the greater Cincinnati well, area? Well, one of the reasons why we're world famous for our fossils is that you really cannot pick up a rock without a fossil in it, some kind of a shell. Except there's always one smart kid somewhere <laughs> who manages to do it. But it's very, very rare because our abundance, the amount of different types of animals and just the plethora of them is so outstanding that we really are spoiled in this area. So the kinds of creatures that we're going to be looking for are marine. Mm -hmm. They're sea invertebrates, so things like clams and snails are, are more common to most of us. Uh, ancient extinct arthropods called trilobites, which are usually what people go for. They want to get those trilobites. Uh, crinoids, which are echinoderms, sponges, corals. Uh, big cephalopods, some of our cephalopods could get up to 25 feet long. Uh, yeah, big cephalopods. Um, so all this is a very biodiverse uh, community of marine organisms. What's the most amazing thing that you have seen that someone has found locally? Huh, well, you know, it's funny because what I would consider to be most amazing is probably fairly esoteric. Uh, in the sense that um, I pick up a lot of brachiopods and bryozoans and trilobites and so forth. We get the big Isotelus maximus trilobites, which are, is the Ohio State fossil, yes, which is, is fantastic. But I really like the rare, weird things. And there's this particular group of fossils called conularids. Mm -hmm. um, they are sort of a, uh, a group between sponges and corals, and uh, they have a square uh, exoskeleton. Okay. With sort of a sea anemone coming out the top, mm -hmm. and they're uh, very, very rare to find. Usually, you find them flat, but oftentimes we can find them inflated, so they look like a big ice cream cone. When you find those, when I find those, I get pretty excited. No doubt. <laughs> but <laughs> it's it's about this big. It's not. It's about the size of a of a T Rex tooth, maybe. There but, you go. But they're fairly rare, so. I remember when uh, Jurassic Park and, and the movies first, very first started coming out, there was a huge rush of people talking about it. they wanted to be paleontologists, they right. wanted to go on a dinosaur dig. Are you still seeing that now? Are you still oh. seeing that excitement? In? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I still want to be a paleontologist when I grow up, and I am one. <laughs> um, I've, ne I've never wanted to be anything else. And a lot of people that I meet that have a passion or an interest in it um, didn't realize they could do this going into school, so they went on to other avenues, or didn't know that they could get a job in it. And they went off to other avenues, but they've maintained it as a hobby or a passion, um, you know, through most of their life. Um, paleontology is fantastic because I consider it a gateway science. It's accessible, mm -hmm. it's fun for families and kids, and it opens up our minds um, to the appreciation of science as a whole, no matter what area of life you happen to go into, science or otherwise. 
Um, and so I think people maintain that childhood passion uh, for paleontology, and that, that usually is focused on dinosaurs, but, but I challenge everybody to, to look at the rest of the fossil record, because there's some really cool, funky things in there. Elizabeth, what do you want people to take away from this exhibit when they walk out those doors after seeing dinosaurs? Well, I think it's the passion for science education and, and that spark of curiosity that, you know, if, if we could turn out more fabulous people like <laughs> Dr. Hunda and, and have people get so excited about learning and continuous learning, I mean, that's the role for the museum to play. So I love that, that it is lots of families coming and all getting excited across different ages about what they're seeing and that spark of curiosity that we are igniting with the science education. And, you know, Union Terminal Museum Center is such a unique place in the sense that we have the Children's Museum and the Science Museum and the History Museum there. We have the entire spectrum of learning from the time you are you know, an infant until you are 95, 96, 100 plus years old. There is something for you to learn and discover and gain insight from it at Cincinnati Museum Center. And the fact that we get to bring these wonderful exhibitions from other partners helps augment what we do on a daily basis. And we hope it just kind of creates that ongoing reason, I gotta go back, I gotta see it again. I got to, you know, I got to learn more about this dinosaur or that dinosaur or some other aspect of our community. Do you find that you have a lot of repeat visitors? Absolutely. And one of the best things <laughs> is to become a member so you can, it's, it's a great value and in particularly with this exhibition because we are giving discounted tickets to members for the first time, um, the first entrance into the exhibition. And then once they buy their first ticket to the Ultimate Dinosaurs exhibit, they can come back for free over and over and over again. So you really can continue to do all of that learning that you want to do throughout the summer and into the fall. So it's, it's just a great privilege to be able to share all of this content that we have at Museum Center with our community, and it's, it's a lot of fun. And share with us again why, I mean, this is so amazing. This is the U.S. premiere, and yep. it's right here in Cincinnati. How important is that? For our community as a whole. I think it's just another phenomenal reason that Cincinnati is the place that you want to come visit. I mean, uh, when exhibit companies come and talk to us, they know that the Cincinnati public appreciates the content that we are presenting. They know that the Cincinnati area is going to turn out and take advantage of the information that we're providing, whether it's the Bodies Exhibition or the Cleopatra Exhibition or the Pompeii Exhibition or the Vatican Exhibition. I mean, these exhibit producers and museum partners know that we have a community that is interested in learning and interested in learning across a lot of different um, areas of, of focus. So it, it, it makes a lot of sense for Cincinnati to be the place that it gets kicked off around the country. Dr. Hunter, we only have a few minutes left, but I've got to ask you, you mentioned earlier in the interview, you said that you expect more yes. breeds of dinosaurs to be found. How do they go about making these discoveries? Do they go to like at long abandoned pits? How does that process <laughs> even begin? Well, you know, we have such a, a good record of the evolution of organisms on Earth through time that we understand the basic broad scale patterns of where organisms should be, what kinds, and at what time in Earth's history. So since we've amassed such a huge database library of fossil organisms, we can now say, well, if I want to go look for a certain type of organism, I should probably look for rocks of the right type, sedimentary, uh, typically, and of the right age, exposed and accessible in order to go and, to go and find them. So you look on a map and you say, where have we not been? Where can I find those rocks of that age? And let's go explore. So it's still part of the old uh, exploration, sort of Indiana Jones kind of feeling <laughs> sometimes, if you like, which is a lot of fun, um, with some guidance um, in mind from um, what we know about sedimentology and stratigraphy and what we know about the geologic time scale. So a lot of really great educational guesses and a lot of success in that way. And then sometimes you just accidentally sit on something, <laughs> and it is just that simple. Rumors of the next big dig? Oh my goodness. Well, there's a lot of stuff going on in Patagonia right now. There's a lot of stuff going on still in Antarctica. Um, Africa has a whole lot to offer yet. And China is amazing for its dinosaurs, particularly its feathered dinosaurs. So we have a lot to see. And let's not forget that we have not discovered everything in our own country. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work to do. Hmm. So we'll be watching for you, maybe digging somewhere around this area sometime soon. Uh, well, I definitely do field work in this area every <laughs> summer. So if you see somebody on the road cuts, don't honk. <laughs> Dr. Hunter and Elizabeth, thank you so much thank for being you. with us today and for bringing thank your you. friends with you. <laughs>
Thank you. For additional information about the Cincinnati Museum Center and their exhibitions, you may visit their website at cincymuseum.org. You may also call them at 287-7000. To watch this and other Focus episodes again on demand, you can do so at our website, cetconnect.org forward slash focus. Thank you for watching. I'm Kathy Laird, and we'll see you next time right here on Focus. Tell us what you think about the programs we air, or let us know if you would like to see a particular topic on Focus. There are several ways you can contact us. You can send your comments by email to focus at cetconnect.org. You can call us at 513-345-6522, or you can write to us at Focus, care of Andrew Dahman, 1223 Central Parkway, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45214. Any use or rebroadcast of this copyrighted program or portions thereof is prohibited without the expressed written approval of CET.